Um, we've talked a lot about um, your various influences. Some of them literary, some of them musical, some of them based on old maps, say, or um, the internet, the images that you download. We're sitting in front of, you're sitting in front of a painting called Blood Buzz. What's that reference and, and how does it relate to this painting and why did you choose that title? I chose the title because it was from a song by a group called The National. I thought it was a really interesting lyric. And uh, it talks about a kind of disturbance or an excitement that occurs uh, when you experience uh, something about the landscape that, uh, I don't know, affects you. And I think in these paintings, what I was primarily uh, influenced by was the uh, duplication of different places overlapped. And uh, they refer to landscapes both on the East Coast and the West Coast. And so what I've done is tried to kind of uh, layer a number of different references about the experience of the landscape and then tried to kind of fictionalize them somewhat so that uh, they occur as places in the making or through the making of them. They're not specific places, but they can be believed to be a landscape that may exist, you may encounter. And uh, evidently I have to be uh, disturbed or excited or in some way touched by uh, the image that arises out of this uh, method. So these are imagined landscapes, they're not specific places. Most of the paintings that I make are about imagined places. They are uh, referencing many different things. What's interesting about this show is it's a survey essentially of one, two, three, four bodies of work that have been going on concurrently over a period of one to two years. And so even though some of the influences are similar throughout, each group deals with different influences pertaining to the specifics of that body of work. So for the Dedham series, for example, they evidently refer to uh, English landscape painting. And what I've done nevertheless is uh, looked at that landscape but fragmented it, reinvented it through collage or for, through Photoshop. And uh, because I was very, very uh, interested in, in making achromatic painting, black and white painting, I wanted to see what would happen if I made these paintings uh, in black and white and how that might affect the reading of the memory and the influence of landscape painting. And it has a kind of literary scale. So there's a feeling of history being reconnected through reproduction, certainly but also through, well, in my uh, case, the lived experience of well, coming from England, coming from that landscape. Have you been to Denham? You know what, I never have. I've been to different parts of England that are very close by, both uh, in the south of England and in uh, the Midlands. Uh, but the part of England I was most familiar with before I came to Canada would have been either Cornwall or Hertfordshire. Why do you keep going back to Constable? Uh, I don't think I necessarily do. I think that what invariably happens is that people see that influence and it's, and it's kind of a connection. Uh, when I think about the large paintings, I'm really not looking at a reference to history at all. I'm trying to uh, contemplate the here and now of the experience and the fabrication of space and place. Um, I think that there will never be me tiring nevertheless of what were the things, what were the nuts and bolts of my uh, background that encouraged me to always be stirred and affected by a tradition of landscape painting. And since I was born and grew up uh, in England, I've always been affected, whether it would be by uh, painters from the past or even contemporary painters. And we've mentioned, for example, painters like Ian McKeever, whose work is much more about the imminent, the here and now. Yesterday, when you were talking to a curator from the Glenbow Museum, Beverly Charlene, you spoke about your first coming to Canada and the impressions you had of the natural world, the landscape, and you alluded to the fact that you still had this kind of notion that the landscape was pure. Yeah. That, that it hadn't been scarred yeah. as we think of it today. 
your opinion has changed, obviously, oh, yeah. through your experience. And how has that affected your painting? Was, was there a more kind of idealized, uh, uh, romanticized sort of view when you were painting back 20, 30 years ago, as opposed to now? Um, well, what happened when I first came to Canada in the uh, late 70s was uh, my kind of, uh, rather kind of, somewhat naive impression of the notion that footsteps were being made in places, certainly in Quebec, that had never been made by human beings, certainly before. So it was a landscape that, to a certain degree, appeared either mute or pristine. And I think it was a momentary kind of sensation or understanding or concept, because evidently the planet is not pristine. And I think it's affected the work in lots of different ways. I think one of the series, for example, that you're exhibiting in this exhibition is the war series. And I'm not only looking at uh, landscape from the past or trying to assimilate visually what's happening with my understanding of landscape presently, Canadian landscape. I'm also looking at a legacy and a history of war and sites of devastation. So that these are received invariably through the internet digitally. And so what I'm trying to do in the group of war paintings that I call ACTS is to say that there's a legacy of horror and devastation. And I've taken images from different uh, arenas of warfare. And I've compressed them into one time by making them all, again, black and white paintings. And I've chosen uh, a kind of sequence of a landscape being affected by bombardment, almost like the flash before or just after some kind of uh, explosion, some kind of uh, yeah, uh, result of a kind of bomb hitting uh, a site. So yeah, I mean, I'm also looking at landscape not necessarily as bucolic, certainly, but as a landscape that has the legacy of, uh, of death, of regeneration, of one that we have to reflect on is the site, obviously, of conflict, has been, and sadly seems to always be the case. So I look at that too, very seriously in the painting. We, we've been talking about this exhibition as a, as a kind of mini-survey uh, of your work, and um, one of the things that's striking about, about the show is the uh, issue of scale. There are some very small collage works, um, some smaller works on board and uh, some, some mid-sized paintings done in a kind of serial or sequential sort of manner. And then there are these two very large paintings and um, you're sitting in front of a painting called Blood Buzz and um, I get the impression uh, from talking to you the last few days that you like this painting. Yeah. And, uh, can we talk a little bit about the making of the painting and, yeah. and the motivation behind it and, and how you made this painting? Yeah. Um, the two big paintings are different to me and Blood Buzz I think is particularly interesting for me because it seemed to come about a little bit more speedily. Sometimes the paintings will take several months to complete and I'm working on two or three at the same time. Uh, what happens with uh, paintings like Blood Buzz is they come through more quickly. And uh, there'll be lots of kind of layering, there'll be lots of uh, coming and going over a period of time where I'm reworking the surfaces, looking at what's happening with color. These are quite formal issues in the activity of making a painting. And uh, so I was really excited by this particular painting because I was able, I felt, to deal with all of the kind of things that are peculiar to the activity of being a painter. So that, for example, I could deal with color, pigmentation, I can deal with uh, all kinds of issues to do with the surface. And it came together relatively quickly. And there were things that I wanted to really kind of deal with. I wanted to really deal with the idea that the painting was an unedited um, process of becoming. So that uh, if I could leave something of the rawness of the initial mark making, as well as evidence what was happening right towards the end of the painting, it gives, I think, a really interesting read through time of the making of that work. And what I like about this particular painting is that you get that. And I've been able uh, to, I think, include that sense of making through a period of time, whereas I've nevertheless evidenced and not totally covered. I've not layered and taken away any of the signature of its making.
I remember years ago speaking with Harold Plunder about where he starts and with making a painting. And, and Harold answered uh, with the idea of color. He said, I, I want to make a yellow painting. Where, where do you start? Well, I, I start there and then I lose my way completely. This painting started off as a green painting and kind of ended up as a kind of flesh colored, more kind of russet kind of painting. So sometimes it's really, really simple. Sometimes the impetus, as you say, could be what color, how will I key that in? But more importantly than any actually of the formal elements is the idea that the painting has a life and an existence apart from oneself. So I could come in with all kinds of uh, uh, notions of where I might want to go, a, a kind of sense of an outcome, but that will always change. I almost kind of steer it to change so that I'm continually kind of addressing the kind of, almost the kind of uh, uncertainty of what it means to make a painting like this. Because there's always that sense of the whole thing might just kind of fall away moments before you feel you might have finished it. Uh, but I do always begin with a very distinct ground, and I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll use colors that I detest, colors that make no sense to me whatsoever, so I immediately need to respond to it. There's nothing worse for me than a white canvas. I, I don't know what that is. It just leaves me completely cold. So I invariably need to uh, disturb the surface before I begin. Something there to engage with. Do you draw anything out on the canvas initially? I draw a lot of things out in studies, I draw a lot of things out in collages, and I draw a lot of things out by referring to photography. And uh, so that gives me a sense of how I might first start to think about what will happen compositionally. And yeah, so the first marks are in very, very large gestures, not that dissimilar to a drawing activity, but they could change very quickly to become simply the interactive large shapes. So all kinds of different issues to do with what it means to compose something visually through color, shape, line, surface, all these things I almost engage with immediately. So research is a big part of, 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 of the initial process. Absolutely. And, and are, you, are you constantly researching material and, and, and engaging with all of the wide range of interests that you're talking about, from images on the internet to your knowledge of our history to your own experiences walking around in the landscape in the woods, camping, yeah. whatever you do. Um, does it suddenly the light bulb just go on or how does it, what happens? That's a great question. Well, the influence is twofold. The influence is these paintings here exhibited and the influence is ongoing. And that comes from uh, a sense of urgency derived from meeting either an image or uh, an abstraction of some kind where you say to yourself, there's a journey here that I need to take. I don't know what it's gonna be, I don't know what the outcome will be, but I need to take it because something here has kind of disturbed me in a really positive way. I need to pursue this. That's how I would pursue, for example, the uh, war series of paintings. It's how I would pursue uh, the idea of writing embedded within the watercolors and the collage uh, of drawings. So there's always something that I need to or want to uh, quarrel with. Uh, there's an urgency there. And uh, I think a lot of that is my huge passion for being in the studio and hands-on making things. That's something that has never left me. And I th feel incredibly fortunate that somehow <laughs> that seems to keep going uh, because I truly uh, am utterly at home with being in the studio and working. This is, this is the real home for me. Michael Smith, thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> meeting you. <laughs>